Good morning, everyone. This is Lori DeToro from eMain and Fluke Excelix. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's best practice webinar. As a software and sensor provider, we offer an array of webinars and other education, including product demos and product training. Our best practice webinar series focuses not on our technology and software, but on maintenance strategies and solutions with speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their knowledge. Today, we are very pleased to have with us John Reeve, author and CMMS champion at Total Resource Management, who will be presenting today's topic, Failure Modes to Failure Codes. Good morning, John. How are you doing? Good morning, Laurie, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, while we're waiting for our listeners to log on, I wanted to ask you a question about why you and Derek Burley decided to write and publish this book. Uh, well, good question. Uh, Terrence O'Hanlon, um, the uh, owner of Reliability Web, asked uh, Derek and I to write a book. Um, the, the subject was pertaining to failure modes, and actually Terrence came up with this exact title for the book. Uh, and so one year later, uh, it got published and released. And so it's available this very moment on Amazon. Um, but to answer your question, uh, there seems to be two distinct worlds. Uh, one is the software side, the CMMS practitioners, and then you have the reliability professionals. And uh, they weren't really communicating, especially on the topic of failure modes. And that's one answer to the question. Excellent, thanks so much. Before John gets started, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. Today's session is being recorded, so the phone lines will be muted to minimize background noise. We will save time after the presentation for um, everyone who's listening to ask questions. You can use the questions feature on GoToWebinar to submit your questions and comments at any time during John's presentation. And I will read them to John so he can respond during our Q&A period at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to receive a copy of today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of today's session. The recorded webinar will be available in Emate University on the Emate website best practices page. Also, everyone attending the live event, thanks to Terrence O'Hanlon from Reliability Web, will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of John's book, Failure Modes to Failure Codes. And as I said, this is courtesy of Reliability Web, and we thank them for this generous gift to one of our attendees. Someone from Fluke Excelix will e email the winner sometime this week to let them know that they have won. You don't have to do anything to be entered. Just listening to the webinar today, the live event will get you entered. So that's all I have for right now. So John, please get started. Oh, uh, great. So uh, this is a book. There's a picture of failure modes, the failure codes. Um, and as we've stated, the uh, Reliability Web and Uptime Elements uh, published the book. Uh, Derek Burley uh, uh, co-wrote this with me and he has uh, expertise world-class expertise in RCM facilitation. So he help, helps uh, customers uh, review uh, critical systems and come up with the uh, failure modes and the applicable uh, maintenance strategies. And my strength is on the CMMS side. And so we brought our two uh, subject matter expertise uh, together and, and wrote this content, which uh, seems to be well received by the user community uh, around the world. Um, the, here's a, a slide which explains uh, three terms which sound very much alike. So we have asset management, we have the asset management system, and then there's the asset management software. They all sound alike, don't they? So let's try to describe this. Um, and so asset management is the information that you would extract from the asset management system. The uh, entire system is that uh, oval containing those uh, five uh, verticals in there, which actually come from reliability web uptime elements. And the software is the little blue circle, uh, the CMMS product, uh, whatever software you are using, and that is the asset management software. So again, the asset management system is the combination of software, process, and organization. And, uh, and my interpretation of that is on the right there, which can be broken into five key strategies um, as you see listed. But 
The topic of interest today is chronic failure analysis. That really is the subtopic of this book, chronic failure analysis, and we're going to try to explain that. So wouldn't it be great if you could design your CMMS to extract value and improve asset reliability? What a novel idea. So advanced processes provide the largest potential return on investment, and chronic failure analysis is at the top of that list. Chronic failure analysis uh, further explained, um, it may be the most significant benefit yet to be realized by the world of asset management. And here's a gentleman, uh, Charles Latino, uh, a reliability professional. Um, he stated upwards of 40 to 60% of all maintenance costs can be attributed to recurring failures. So that word chronic, it really just means recurring. So therein, I would think this would want to, you would want this to be a major focus no matter what industry you are in. So there are some prerequisites. Unfortunately, when we're talking about advanced processes, um, they are more complex. And because of that, uh, the, the software process and roles need to come together. The first one is um, capturing the failure mode on the work order. Um, and so when the, the work is complete, the technician should know what the failed component is, and that's one piece of the failure mode. Okay. Um, secondly, it, it, it would help to have a, uh, a reliability team or a reliability engineer or even a maintenance engineer who would run this uh, Pareto-style failure analytic, which focuses on the worst offenders. The, the word Pareto is a, an Italian um, uh, person who uh, identified the concept of the significant few having the, the most uh, substantial problems or bad actors in this case. And so uh, the last one is um, this would produce a, a top 10 list of bad actors and then you would uh, drill down on the selected assets to arrive at the proper failure mode and, and ideally the true cost code. So um, sometimes you'll see questions on the internet where people are asking for the best uh, failure code hierarchy, uh, what codes do you use, et cetera, et cetera. Seldom do you see anyone asking for what would be the ideal failure analytic. This is unfortunate. Um, it, really, this is how, how we make the purpose of, of utilizing a CMMS in uh, tracking asset management is not to enter failure codes, but it should be to make uh, more informed decisions. And you need a failure analytic to do that in the reliability team I just mentioned. So failure analysis, chronic failure analysis, is really the end game that we're after. RCM, anal RCM analysis is a more complex process. And um, I just have this slide here to define what it is and the relationship to our topic. So uh, Derek Burley would perform RCM analysis and he would ask the uh, the, the customer, the uh, cross-functional team in the room, um, these seven questions, and you can see those listed. But the one I want to focus on is number three, which is what are the failure modes for each failed state? So he uh, defines that, identifies those failure modes, and then from that information, they would identify the maintenance strategy or proactive tasks to try to predict and or prevent these going forward. So if, if that's defined, put that in your left hand, and then as we mentioned a moment ago, if we capture the failure mode on the work order, put that in your right hand, and now we can link these two together. So here we're talking about unplanned breakdowns, you know, what can be done. So before the uh, breakdown occurs, theoretically or ideally, RCM analysis, which we just discussed, would identify those potential failure failure modes and, and then uh, identify the suggested maintenance strategies. You implement those maintenance strategies and, and ideally you prevent these failures from happening. But if the failure still occurs, then if it's a very significant event, you might perform root cause analysis in some cases, you simply uh, talk to the O&M staff and uh, uh, gather knowledge as to what happened, what was the cause, et cetera. But again, the topic, uh, the suggestion we're proposing is chronic failure analysis, 
which utilizes the Pareto approach to determine the worst offenders. And if you implement that strategy, you can get ahead of the uh, future breakdowns theoretically and, and mitigate them before they happen. Here's our poll question. Uh, Lori? Hey, thanks, John. Um, yep, I'm going to launch this poll. The question is, what is chronic failure analysis? And is it root cause analysis, PM optimization, analysis of recurring failures, or RCM analysis? So we're going to wait until about 70 or 80 percent of folks have answered, and then I will let you know the results. And hopefully we will get there quickly. I think we're almost there. If you haven't answered, please do. All right, so we're going to close the poll now and share the results out. So we got an answer, 82% said analysis of recurring failures, 8% said root cause analysis, 7% said RCM analysis, and 3% said PM optimization. So those are your answers. Um, John? Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to agree with the 82%. And analysis of recurring failures is the, um, the answer for chronic failure analysis. So we'll move on, Lori? Yes, please do. Okay. Uh, here we go. So um, now the audience uh, has a variety of uh, CMMS products, most likely, and so uh, their work order screen would look differently. Um, this is one example, though. Um, you have a work order number and it's a description to the right, and you link it to an, an equipment record. Perhaps you identify that a functional failure has occurred. But the fields of note, though, um, are the yellow, blue, and uh, orange. And those three pieces make up the failure mode. Now, if your software does not have these fields on the screen, uh, you might ask the system administrator if it's possible to configure your product. Okay. Um, here's a slide describing the uh, where the com failed component fits into the hierarchy, right? So uh, at the top, you have your company, and then it gets into the uh, uh, unit and building. Um, a system, subsystem, and then we eventually get down to the asset number. Uh, and sometimes an asset can be broken into sub assets, fine. But the field that we're introducing is the failed component, which is, I'm going to go back to that slide. And so the failed component is the yellow box, and you can see that there. And that could be a validated field that has a choice list to it. All right. Here are some examples of failed components uh, in the case of a mechanical pump. So um, impeller vanes, uh, bearings, uh, casing, uh, wear ring, seal, any of this stuff can fail. And so that is the information you want to put in that field. And that's the first piece of the failure mode. Um, now, to differentiate between a component versus a stock part, uh, a little harder, harder to say. But um, a component can be, can be a stock part, such as packing, but not all components are stored in the warehouse inventory, you know, such as impeller veins. This, yeah. Okay, so um, we have, uh, sometimes you have a field on the work order screen titled asset problem code, and then we have the component problem code. I'm interested in the component problem code, but I wanted to differentiate between the two. So a pump, an asset is could be a feed water pump, and it may long, no longer be pumping at full capacity or pumping at all. Um, and, and therefore, the asset problem code would be um, low output. Um, but when, when the technician gets into the repair, he uh, might identify what the root cause is, and he will definitely know what the failed component is. And in this scenario, we're pretending it was the impeller, and perhaps the uh, impeller was loose or it eroded or corroded. And so um, it would have a different value. So the asset problem code and component problem code are two different fields and could have two different values. 
cause codes. There's a gentleman named uh, Winston Lede, who's who's written several books and um, uh, very experienced on this subject of cause codes. And he stated that uh, in some industries, upwards of 84% of all uh, breakdowns and asset failures can be related to the human factor. That's a big number, 84%. With that understanding, I thought it was necessary to provide a substantial uh, choice list, uh, in this case, even a hierarchy, to help the user community identify the cause code. Now, we're not doing root cause analysis, but we're trying to get closer than most uh, customers are with their CMS product right now. And so I start with, uh, you can have three fields here. Cause one, we start with cause one, and so the technician would fill this in. Um, maybe it's normal wear, or maybe it's aging, and that would be their answer. Um, it could be a force majeure, uh, which is French for um, a, an unusual, maybe a weather event, um, a tornado, hurricane, flooding, etc. cetera. Um, there could be a power failure. This is quite often a cause of uh, asset failure. Um, and, and maybe it's a mistake altogether. There is no defect. Now, if it's not a, one of those five black, uh, black and white choices, then it must be some other cause. All right. And so if he chooses a, uh, uh, other causes, then the cause two field would become a mandatory. Yeah, and now we've got a, a broader range of uh, choices in the cause two field, and you can read those. I won't read every one there, but these are human factors. Yep, it could be operators, it could be the maintenance guy himself, it could be the, the designer of the equipment, it could be the vendor who installed it, um, it could be the uh, the transport of that material to the site or it could be improper storage in the warehouse any one of those things could cause uh, impact to the the asset or component in this case um, now if it's not any of the black and white and we end up choosing workmanship now we must answer cause three all right and again you can read those but uh, I sometimes the these um, administration looking at uh, these fields here for the first time, they become concerned, well, who is going to put this in? You might need, the answer is, you might need uh, different roles within the organization. So cause one would be filled in by the technician. Cause two could be by the technician or the maintenance supervisor. And sometimes uh, cause three would require the, the maintenance or reliability engineer. Um, you could start out slow and only go after your critical assets. So whenever a critical asset has a, an unplanned breakdown, then you absolutely make sure these fields get filled in. And then over time, expand it to uh, other uh, criticality levels of assets. That's how I would approach the capture of the cause codes. So poll question number two. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to launch this one for you. What is a failure mode? And the choices are failure code, failure class, asset plus the problem code plus, plus the cause code, or component plus the component problem plus the cause code. And we're going to wait until a good number of folks have answered. So please chime in as quick as you can. And please also remember while we're waiting for the results to type in your questions for John so we can ask them at the end of the presentation. All right, I think we've had a good number answer, so we're going to close this poll. And let's share the results. So what is a failure mode? We've got 60% say that it is the component plus the component problem plus the cause code, and about 30% say it's the asset plus the problem code plus the cause code, 7% failure class, and 3% failure code. So those are our answers, John, and we're ready for you when you are ready. Thank you, Lori. Well, again, I, I like the audience's choice on number four, which is component, component problem and cause code. Those three pieces make up the failure mode. Okay, here are some examples. So, so I'm gonna uh, repeat what we just said on the poll. So the fail component, and then 
the component problem, and then the cost code. So let's see if we can find those three pieces in these examples, yeah? So the motor bearing, that's the component. It, it failed, that's the component problem, and due to contamination. Um, let's pick another one here, all right? So on the right side, we have um, a pump impeller, that's the component, fails due to erosion. So you can read those, but that those, those examples there identify uh, failure modes. And this uh, slide actually came from another author, um, Douglas Plucknett, and his book, RCM Blitz. All right. Here, now, here is output from the, the system that you could extract over time. So as the cost codes are entered, you can do a, a grouping of them. And then I, I pulled this from one organization, and uh, the blue text is something I typed in here. So if I were the maintenance engineer, I would start asking these additional questions. And okay, so if we have a design flaw, and the uh, technicians said that there were 24 work orders where assets had design flaws, um, I would want to re study that further, talk with the technician and, and start investigating the asset and possibly talk to the, uh, the vendor that we purchased this from or, and or the manufacturer. Isn't that interesting where the technicians have the knowledge of equipment that has a design flaw? Yep, that's, it's actually, it's not surprising um, in what many organizations fail to ask the technicians for their input and they are a wealth of knowledge. Okay, improper fastening. So in that case, the technicians are grading themselves. They're saying that maybe uh, some of our skills are not where they should be. And the term there is called precision maintenance training. Um, some organizations would benefit by conducting that. So you can read that there. And um, those are my thoughts on how uh, I, as a maintenance engineer, would approach each one of the issues. The objective is... Um, to seek continuous improvement. Now, this is the failure analytic. So uh, you may have a better design for a failure analytic. Perhaps your software has a, a tremendous one, right, a great one right now. Um, but here's how we do this. Uh, you choose the category that you want to perform the Pareto sort on. It could be on the number of, of functional failures or it could be on mean time between failures, so you would sort on the smallest value and put that at the top, put that at the top. You could do it on asset condition, which is a subjective grade, the one through five, in indicating the condition of the asset. You could track it on maintenance downtime. The metric I really like is the average annual maintenance cost divided by the replacement asset value. In if you have 6% or greater, that asset is in trouble. So the, the larger number would float to the top if that is the metric you actually sorted on. And of course, you could do it on age, but um, I think uh, just because I'm old doesn't mean I still don't bring value to the table. All right. So once you choose the asset that you want to focus on, and you could have thousands of assets, this report right here will pick the top 10 or whatever the number is. And let's pick that first one there, EN0012. The moment you click on that, then this, this uh, report would dynamically drill down on the failure mode, which consists of the components, the problems, and the cause in the form of a pie chart. So the components are shown, and uh, I would want to click on the largest wedge, which in this case appears to be the air filter. Click on that then the problems would appear. Then I click on the largest wedge there, then the cause would appear. So at that point, with that much information at your fingertips, um, the reliability team would um, uh, perhaps pull up the work orders, uh, print them out individually, start talking to people. But this, this report gives the team a great starting point as to where they should focus uh, to manage by exception and this um, helps you become more proactive and, and increase asset reliability. All right, well, 
uh, that's our presentation, really. Uh, these are some questions, but maybe you have some questions for, for me. Lori? Yeah, John, we had one comment during the time when you were talking about um, identifying the asset and making sure you have all the information you need. And someone commented that if you don't identify the asset, it could get political real quick. So what's your, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, identify the asset uh, on the work order, maybe? Yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, or, or with the failure, maybe that's what they're talking about. Um, well, it's, it's a very important that the work order be linked to the correct asset. If they choose something too high in the hierarchy, uh, that would not be good, and that would follow up all of our, our data capture here, so that would be bad. Um, it's important to have uh, asset criteria defined, and so a, a good maintenance program and, and core team would have that documented as to what an asset is. Um, and, and here we talk about where it fits within the location hierarchy, and, and we differentiate the components. I'm trying to figure out all possible answers. <laughs> well, we definitely have some other questions, too, if we maybe yeah. that person who mentioned that will give us a little more detail. So um, the next question is, what number of codes, failure, cause, and remedy do you think are appropriate, 10 or 20, or do you have another number in mind? Okay, that's a great question. Um, uh, some vendors uh, utilize a failure code hierarchy, and, and there are rules of thumb that says when you bring up a choice list, there shouldn't be more than 20 values or even less in that choice list because users can become confused and may not choose the correct value when they see a list that's too large. Um, I agree with that. However, through the use of modern day technology, there is a feature titled type ahead buffer. It's hard to explain without showing you, but I'll do my best. So um, you're on the failed component field, and if you type in one letter, it will quickly pull up a little dialogue to the right with all records that have that one letter in it. If you type a second letter, you're start, starting to spell out the component, right? If you type a second letter, the dialog will dynamically change instantly. If you type a third letter, you're probably down to uh, six answers at this point. The point, uh, what I've just described works against a failed component listing of 500 values. It's lightning fast, and if your software product allows this feature, it enables you to get around the, the old rule of a static uh, 20 list uh, choice list. I've, I've got this in place at one facility and the maintenance technicians just love that design. They have no problem whatsoever picking out the right failed component out of a list that has 500 entries in it. That was a long answer, but that, uh, that's what we're doing. That's great. No, that's a good answer. And um, we have another question that um, I think I know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it and let you answer it. <laughs> Is it necessary to have technology application for failure coding? How about paper-based systems? Um, well, it's, paper is definitely better than nothing. Uh, the challenge with the paper is when you go to file the completed work order, what uh, file folders sequencing do you place it in? You could do it by work order number. You could do it by asset. You could do it by report date or some other parameter. You, that's a very critical decision because once you make that decision, it's, uh, it's hard to go another direction. So, um, 
I would consider putting it into electronic medium. Even Excel would be a great step forward, access Excel, where you can do word searches uh, across uh, all of the content historically and start to pull out things in that manner. Um, and again, with electronic medium, you can add the validated fields to uh, achieve um, a better results. It's hard to manage thousands of assets when you don't have uh, a medium, a software and, and data at your fingertips. Um, again, paper is better than nothing, but uh, you could see significant improvement just with um, Excel and Access. And of course, there's uh, hundreds of other products, formal CMMS systems, that integrate the work order with the entire enterprise, including warehouse and purchasing, to add substantial value. Great, thank you. Um, next question we have is, how does CBM fit into the process? Okay, condition-based uh, monitoring, also condition-based technologies, or it could be condition-based maintenance. So sometimes these acronyms uh, mean different things to different people, and I'll try to answer all three there. Uh, so condition-based technologies include uh, vibration analysis, uh, ultrasound, sound, uh, infrared, oil analysis, et cetera. And um, because many failures are random, the utilization of these technologies uh, on a scheduled basis enable you to identify defects early in the life of that asset. Um, and when you perform RCM analysis, uh, that typically is the focus of, of that process. So those technologies are valuable. Now, when you discover a, a defect, a, a new, you, the, the maintenance engineer or reliability engineer or the analyst involved, they will talk about it. Um, it comes down to risk management and they will decide whether or not they need to create a work order right away. Most of the time they do. But the second question is how soon should they perform that uh, repair work? The good news is because the breakdown has not uh, occurred yet, they can properly plan and schedule this work. So that's the good news, yeah. Um, it may be a month later or, or during a scheduled uh, shutdown outage that they plan to do this work. So in summary, um, that technology is beneficial and what the new work type for the follow-on work order might be called condition-based maintenance. And so that's another use of that term. Um, sometimes the uh, vendor has a different acronym altogether called PDM, which is predictive maintenance, but they're really the same concept. Hopefully I, I hit one of the answers there that they're interested in. Lori? Okay, thank, thank you. Um, what's the best way to apply this to a brand new CMMS installation? Should an implementation be started after the culture change of actually using a CMMS and entering WR and WO becomes a habit, or should this be rolled out at the beginning? Oh man, I love that question. Um, <laughs> okay. I think the implementation team, project team, core team should first of all understand the significance of what we're talking about. As I stated at the beginning, I don't know of any other initiative or advanced process that adds more value or potential return on investment. Okay, now sometimes when you're installing, implementing software, you just can't do everything at once. With this knowledge that the team now has, you might get the failed failure mode fields, the three of them, the failed component, component problem, cause code on the screen, at least so they are there. And then after go live, within the first three months, maybe you go after critical assets and you make it mandatory that those fields get filled in for repair work on critical assets. Maybe uh, six, 12 months later, you uh, design, implement the failure analytic 
and and roll that out. Uh, now, having said what I just said, you, you definitely want to be aware of what the failure analytic looks like because that actually determines the uh, failure fields, the failure data rather, that you want to capture. The last point is every day that you put off the capture of failure data, validated failure data in this manner is lost failure history. You may have it as text in a narrative field, but you cannot write a single analytic SQL aggregate command against text. Maybe in 10 years you'll be able to do that, but not right now. And so uh, to repeat that statement, because it's quite significant, every day that goes by right now without capturing validated failure data, all you have is a work order ticket system and that failure history cannot be recovered. Great, so, thank you. Go ahead, Lori. I'm sorry. Were no, you finished? I, yes, yes. Okay. Someone requested that you go back to the slide that had the list of questions and your contact information on it for just a second so they can take a look at it. And then I also have another question, but I wanted to ask you to do that. There we go. Thank you. There it is. Um, yeah. The next question is, do you like offering a selectable option of other for situations where an answer category isn't known or isn't in the pull down? The comment on that is, as an analyst, I resent the data in the other category, but I see the need for it. Well, uh, geez, this is another great question. You've got a good audience, uh, Lori. Um, we do. We always yeah. do. Okay. Uh, I love talking to business analysts, uh, maintenance analysts, and reliability engineers, and this particular question and subject is, is, is very important. What I have done is I, I do not like the word other either. <laughs> and I do not offer that as a choice in any of my lists. Now, what I do perform is I add a brand new field. Let me go back to the screen. I didn't show it on the screen, but maybe I can explain it. Come on. There it is. So right below the failed component field or in that area, I might add a brand new field uh, that's free format text. And it would be the label would be titled missing component because that's most likely where it's going to be and and so they would type in whatever they think is a valid missing component and when they save the record um, elect, um the software would automatically send an email message to the uh, reliability engineer and tell him uh, this person has suggested a new uh, code be entered he would process that record and come back and enter it into the component list as well as update the work order with the right value. And so it's painless for the uh, requester and it's efficient because it uh, closes the loop and the maintenance engineer has full control over what new entries get placed into the uh, validated field. Hopefully that explained it. Thank you, John. Um, as we said at the beginning, this is not a obviously not a Fluke Excelix promotional webinar, but we've gotten two questions asking if eMaint has the ability to generate the um, failure mode and failure code fields. And uh, John, you and I were talking about that right at the beginning uh, when we got online, and we yes, they do. I think there is some configuration involved, but um, we can get someone from our eMate team to connect with the two people who asked this question and give you some more information about it um, after the webinar. But yes, we can, um, uh, eMate CMS, CMMS can help with um, this category that John is talking about. So now I'm going to ask a question that is um, more general. Can you shed some light on the capability of the current reliability analytics softwares to look at asset capturing inputs from all condition monitoring technologies? Wow. Um, repeat the question one more time. Sure. Um, can you shed some light on the capability of current reliability analytics softwares to look at asset capturing inputs from all condition monitoring technologies. Okay, um, I do do not have um, 
knowledge perhaps in this area to provide a, a decent answer, but I'll uh, answer it the best I can. There are certainly add-on products to the CMMS system you are using, which can be bolted on. Um, and they sometimes come with proprietary software, including um, uh, failure mode libraries. And they also might make it easier to integrate the condition-based technologies uh, data into the CMMS product when thresholds are um, exceeded. Um, I think that's a great utilization of features of those products and can be successfully integrated with the CMS software. I just don't have any brand names to share with you, um, but hopefully I'm, I'm answering the question. Now, if, but I'm gonna cap it, uh, summarize by saying, if the main interest here is capturing the failure mode, uh, I, I would try to just simply configure the existing base product because you're not adding any annual costs, additional costs to your service. And if it's possible, you could even create a brand new application in the CMMS software titled RCM Analysis and store the results of that analysis inside the product. And now, you are one click away from validating the work order failure mode to the RCM analysis. And imagine the power there. So if a failure mode occurs suddenly on this asset that's not in RCM analysis, well, then you can start asking questions. Well, why did the facilitator not identify this failure mode? Um, or maybe the failure mode is there, but they chose the wrong maintenance strategy. So. I, I like to stay within the product um, where possible, but again, I have nothing uh, bad to say about the add-on products. Uh, they provide um, great uh, tools, capabilities, functions, features that the base product would not uh, handle. And I will add that with um, the e for those who have the e have a CMMS system, we do the Fluke Excelix team does have the capability to integrate data from third party sensors and third party systems into the CMMS. So again, that's something that can be discussed later in detail. But that's something that um, Fluke Excelix has. So. Great. Um, what are final calls codes that must be considered in a failure analysis? Um, okay, where is that slide? Well, um, cost codes have always been a challenge for many organizations and software vendors. I came up with this list right here uh, after extensive study. Um, sometimes, uh, organizations and vendors will say that the component is the cause. I, I like the, it's, I'm not sure that's proper. Um, if we utilize the definition of the failure mode that we've outlined, the component is the first piece of the failure mode and, and the cause is as shown here. So the cause is the third piece although it's broken into three levels here, but that feeds the third piece of the failure mode. And it emphasizes human factors where Winston, Winston Lede said 84% of the time it is due to that. So normal wear, aging, power failure, other than that, we're talking human factors. And until you uh, correct the human factor element, there's a good chance that unplanned breakdown could occur three, six months later. So you could have the world's best um, predictive technologies, condition-based technologies in place, sensors, whatever. But if you fail to identify the proper cause, then 
uh, it's going to occur again and we're losing money. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to admit that I don't know what one of these things are, but I'm going to ask this question. How do you combine the process that processes that you presented with a fracas process? Am I saying that correctly? Yes, you are. All right, awesome. I know what that is. I know what that is. So um, uh, that is a process uh, ac acronym abbreviation that was created uh, by someone else uh, years ago. It's still valid, and uh, maybe Ricky Smith is the gentleman who put that together. I'm not sure, but as I've studied it, I believe chronic failure analysis is the same process. Um, but I want to emphasize the chronic failure analysis that I'm discussing has the failure mode on the work order and the failure analytic uh, design that I mentioned with right here um, and even though I didn't show it here I also have the RCM analysis as a brand new application inside the CMMS and I'm I'm able to link all three of these things together now coming back to this report here I, I identify the top 10 worst assets and that's where many products stop but I take it one step further and provide dynamic drill down on the failure mode. So my chronic failure analysis approach is very comprehensive and provides a wealth of information to the end user to start improving asset reliability. Nothing wrong with fracas. I think it's, um, I've, t I've taken it one step further is what my opinion is. That's great, thank you. The next question I have is how can you ensure that a technician doesn't simply choose the first option to be able to close the work order? Well, um, this is a frequent question. Uh, we really need to back up and conduct training with the maintenance organization as a whole and explain to them the purpose of, of putting in the right data the purpose of, of utilizing that data by other stakeholders to perform failure analysis. The, the, the purpose is to improve return on asset to increase company profit so that that company can stay in business so that employees have a job. Um, the, sometimes the CMMS product is perceived as a people tracking software system and that's unfortunate uh, yes actual man hours are going into the to the system but it's an asset management system and that's how it should be perceived so again if there's misconceptions as to the purpose of the software and why uh, data as in this case failure data needs to be put in correctly accurately in a timely manner um uh, training is needed which emphasizes the end game which emphasizes the purpose of capturing this data and showing the working level how it can be used to help that company stay in business great thank you culture change is probably almost as important as the technology isn't it <laughs> absolutely laurie well said how do you account for confidence in the effectiveness of the performed maintenance, such as inspections and repairs, in the maintenance strategy versus operations failure or wear? Oh boy, these are complex questions. Um, I'm gonna need you to repeat that and um, I'm gonna take some notes when you're talking. Go ahead. One okay, more time. sure, <laughs> absolutely. How do you account for confidence in the effectiveness of the performed maintenance, such as inspections and repairs in the maintenance strategy versus operations failure or wear? Confidence is the key word. Uh, okay, so, so um, if we're talking about the skill level of the O&M tech, um, it, it is a best practice for the leadership to uh, be aware of their skill levels and and track their employees, help them acquire needed knowledge, 
maybe they uh, have a skills matrix that they're tracking. Um, they might leadership might bring in uh, precision maintenance uh, vendors to enhance and prove training where needed. Um, number three, it's the responsibility of the maintenance supervisor foreman to link the right job to the right worker skill um, so that uh, the, the right knowledge is being applied to do the repair. Number four, um, the role of the maintenance supervisor is to periodically uh, spot check work done on the field um, to make sure that they are actually, they printed the work order, they're following the task steps, they're adhering to safety uh, hazard precautions, um, and they're working safely so no one gets hurt and the and, and, and also asset integrity is uh, adhered to, supported. So one, two, three, four, those are four ways to go at that. Um, in terms of operations, uh, yes, uh, they can play a major role from a human factor standpoint. Um, they need to operate the equipment incorrect, correctly uh, and not exceed thresholds. And, uh, and secondly, uh, when operators are performing rounds, um, the maintenance staff, senior maintenance staff, uh, might walk with them that first time or whatever to make sure that they understand potential failure modes that can be observed even through sensory observations. Okay, uh, that was a complex question. I'm not sure if I answered it, but um, those are my thoughts. That's great. Thank you. Um, we had someone ask a general, well, no, not general, a specific question about whether you have implemented a CMMS in any cement plants. Well, I have not yet been to that industry, but they are uh, big time users of CMMS solutions and um, they are out there on the internet in the forums. Uh, they're asking questions and sharing knowledge. So the cement industry is a, a major player in, in this uh, business model. Okay, thank you. And um, we'll also reach out to our team here and see if they have any answers specific to that. Um, someone, while we're asking questions, had asked if you would please show the asset hierarchy slide again. Oh, yes. And I will and, remind everyone as we're going to that that we will share these slides with you after the webinar. So complete the survey at the end and we'll make sure to get a copy of it. Let us know you want it and we'll send it to you. <clears throat> Thank you. The and, next and, question, go well, ahead, I'm if sorry. That, if that person has a follow-on question right now, if he's able to um, type it, I mean, we could try to answer real quick, but it's, I know it's, we'll, it's up to him. Yeah, right, we'll see if it comes through. All right. um, we'll ask this one and give the, that person time to ask the question. Um, could you please repeat how failure treatment prioritization between assets is done for the best results? Failure treatment, okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the uh, failure analytic. So, the report, we're assuming the report exists. If if not, just draw it up on paper. Maybe you take this slide and you hand it to the IT guy and say, uh, go design this report, let me know when you're done. <laughs> That's what I might say. And um, he may have questions back at you and say, well, are you capturing uh, asset condition? And you would answer it. Are you capturing maintenance downtime, et cetera? Um, do your assets have the replacement costs on them? Uh, do you have the installation date? So you've got to make sure you're capturing the data to uh, perform this analytic. Now, repeat the question one more time, Laurie, so I make sure I answer it. Okay. Could you please repeat how is failure treatment prioritization between assets done for best results? Well, uh, on this report here, you have options whereby you could filter uh, critical equipment. Um, so prompt five, I could select uh, uh, criticality one or critic and or criticality two, um, and then run this report against uh, those critical equipments only. 
in failure treatment. So the word treatment. Um, we're trying to identify the worst offenders, and once we do that, that's where we place our focus as stakeholders, as maintenance engineers, as reliability engineers, to manage by exception, to identify the failed component in the problem and get down to the cause. So if we can eliminate the cause, th ideally, theoretically, we can prevent this failure from happening again. That's my only way to answer this. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I hope this isn't too specific. And then it's a two-parter, and I can reread it if you need me to. How do you think that the approach will convert big data into knowledge as operators only need precise information without doing analytics? CMMS is one approach. Have you ever implemented a CMMS system in oil heating system pumps? Um, okay, give me That's the first part again. <laughs> first how part. Do you think, yeah, how do you think the approach and I'm assuming they're talking about the approach of failure modes and failure codes, will convert big data into knowledge as operators only need precise information without doing analytics. Okay, the word operators. So I'm going to assume that's the O&M tech. And uh, I, I might agree where some O&M techs um, simply want failure history in terms of narrative or text on the work order and they are quite happy with that. Uh, so if that asset fails again, uh, they could search six months later, they could search for all work orders historically for the same asset and pull those records up. There might be six, seven records and they can read the text that they and others entered against it. And that is quite helpful when they're trying to determine what, uh, how to repair, what to repair, what caused it, et cetera. I agree with that benefit. Now, if you take that O&M tech um, and you promote him to a maintenance engineer or reliability engineer, and you now say to him, you're now responsible for identifying worst offenders for 5,000 assets, you're going to need this failure analytic or something similar you're going to need the ability to manage by exception. You, you no longer can think as an individual maintenance tech and wait for the failure to occur. These are strong words. You need to be proactive in your thinking and, and be able to answer the question from a senior manager when he asks you the question, what are the worst offenders? And I don't want your opinion. I want it to come from, this, from, from the software itself. And this is when uh, you need the failure data in the product captured correctly. Now, the term big data, uh, thats uh, you see that quite a bit nowadays on the Internet. There's a lot of data, that's for sure, but is it the right data? And uh, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize today in this podcast is the majority of all systems out there and the majority of all organizations have not realized the importance and significance of chronic failure analysis and they are uh, leaving money on the table. They are uh, costing their organization money because they're not able to uh, manage by exception and implement chronic failure analysis. So this is an opportunity to uh, help your organization improve asset reliability and, and stay in business. Thank you. That's Great answer, and unfortunately, we are out of time, and this concludes today's presentation. Thank you, John, so much for joining us. Remember that we will have a we will select a winner of the book Failure Modes to Failure Codes and no, notify you by email. And also, there will be a brief survey at the end. We would appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete the survey and let us know if you would like the slide shared with you. And thanks again for joining us, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. <clears throat> Mm-hmm.